what's going on everybody uh kind of pissed right now today just hasn't been a good day starting out um it kind of is what it is i just want to document this it may or may not make the video if it does you know why um i'm just a little upset right now so i was in my hotel as of right now for you don't know i tell you guys i get out i travel i get i be around a lot so right now i'm out in the I'm in North Carolina, I'm back in the Carolinas again, so I'm in North Carolina. Um, the Raleigh, Durham area, Cary area, somewhere around that nature. I'm at a hotel. Um, for you though, I'll just give you a quick break now. I'm in a hotel room. I decided to work out this morning, so I gotta start back getting back in shape. So usually I do that in the morning when I first wake up. I'm an early to rise person, so um, I'm, I'm heading out to go work out and what ended up happening is and I tell people this all the time things happen for a reason so I'm heading out to work out I work out uh, I'm moving a little bit sluggish today I get to watch in a video or two during my workout and I'm behind schedule it's so big you know like I say things happen for a reason so I come back upstairs take a quick shower uh, washing my face and so forth and at this point in time um, just cut the sink off, standing there looking at the sink like, come on, get yourself going, we gotta get it going, we gotta get going. And what ends up happening is, I hear my room door opening. And I'm like, is that my room door opening? Now at this point, I'll just be honest with you, um, I'm in a towel. <laughs> so, I'm like, is that my room door open? Then I hear somebody sit there and say, so at that point, I hear somebody say my room number. And then he's talking to somebody. He's like, they say it's probably good, but it looks like somebody's still in this thing. And then he's like, this is a really nice laptop. Oh, shit, they got a drone. And so I'm in a one-bedroom suite apartment, and I'll show it to you. So as... He's saying this. I'm like looking. So I put a towel on. Did I come out? Excuse me? He's like, oh, my bad. My bad, man. Um, They told me the room was empty. And he walks back out the door and closes the door. So I called downstairs to the front desk because at this point I'm heated. Front desk answers. Like He's like, hello? I'm like, yeah, I have, I'm, um, I'm in my room. And somebody just uh, kind of walked in my room. And he's like, what room are you in? I'm like, I tell him my room number. So then he says to me, um, oh, it's nothing to be worried about. It's just an employee. Um, I was like, he didn't sound like an employee. He was like, yeah, it's just an employee. I gave him a key to go use the bathroom. I said, so all the bathrooms, public bathrooms on the first floor, because they have a restaurant, there's one by the swim pool for the dressing room and so forth and the workout area. All the public bathrooms on the first floor, you have to hand him a key to the third floor to use a bathroom. And he's like, it's no big deal. Uh, you want something for the snack bar for your inconvenience? And I'm like, no, this is a big deal. I said, because whoever you gave the key to, which I guess is an employee, he walks into my room, which kind of upsets me because he ignores. And this is my thing. If he truly is the hotel employee, I have on the door the tag that says no house cleaning required today and also the one that says do not disturb which I just put them on there because I'm trying to they have this program to help support clean the environment yada 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 so turn down housekeeping services so I, I so I usually do it when I'm out for over a week so they're both tags are hanging on the door. I've never been in a hotel where an, empl an employee doesn't knock on the door and introduce themselves before they come in. Now, there was no knock on the door and not once did he say housekeeping, maintenance, or any sign that he was with the hotel. And then when he saw me, he still didn't say, I'm sorry, I went maintenance or the housekeeping or the hotel Nothing in there saying that he was with the hotel. All he said was they said the room was supposed to be empty and he started bagging out the room. 
So what pisses me off about the situation is you try to dismiss this as if it's like this is okay, as if I shouldn't be mad. And not only that, my point behind the situation is, I'll just be honest with you, if it would have been five minutes earlier, I would have been still downstairs working out. If it had been any other day throughout the week, I would have been gone. And so now my thing is, so if it would have happened five minutes earlier, my wallet was sitting on the counter with cash in it. My laptop was sitting out. I'm trying to upgrade, give you guys better quality videos. So I have a $3,000 laptop now. I got a drone, trying to do some more different angles and so forth. All this stuff is sitting out in the room because I was preparing to shoot a video, which we'll get into that in a minute. So I was preparing to shoot a video. So all this stuff is sitting out in the room, charging and so forth. And he comes in and starts looking at it and admiring it. So realistically, because he never made himself known because you think there's nobody in the room. If he would just decide to take any of this, my wallet, so forth. There's no documentation of whoever been in this room. I wouldn't know. So I'm pissed. And like I said, back to it, so he's trying to, so the person I speak to never gave me his name. Then I asked, well, what's your name? He tells me it's Kevin. I'm not even sure this is his real name because I go downstairs. He's not wearing any names at it. Where everybody else since I've been in the hotel and I've been here four days has on a name tag. Every time I go to the front desk, they have on a name tag. But this individual is not wearing a name tag. So that bothers me, but it's whatever. So at this point, like I'm sitting there saying to you, and I'm going to kind of wrap this up quickly. I just am heated. And so I'm like, how are you kind of dismissing this like this not a problem? Because first of all, the problem to me is if you're saying, well, first you tell me the system says nobody's in the room. Well, that's a problem to me because the night before I went downstairs and I verified because I had two days left that I have a late checkout because the last thing you can do if you're traveling is ask for a late checkout the day of. Sometimes it conflicts, especially there's a lot of people in the hotel. So I usually ask for when I first check in and then I verify it's still that it's in the system a day or two before I actually need it. So I verified last night, late checkout, gave them my room number, the, the, the two people at the front desk, yes, it's in there, sir, you're good to go. So last night it showed I was in this room. So then when I tell you that, you're like, oh, I'm sorry, I just misread it wrong. So now you can't do your job correctly. You look at my room, say nobody is in there, and you give a key to my room. I have an issue with that. So it's like how are you working by yourself if you can't even tell if a room is occupied or not. So this is just kind of pissing me off. So ultimately, I just end up checking out and leaving. But your answer to the situation was, it's not that big of a deal. Why don't you take something from the snack bar? F your snack bar, I'm checking out this hotel. And that's pretty much what I did. And I'm very adamant about not blasting people, but if you ever in the North Carolina area, please don't stay at this hotel. So please don't stay at the Holiday Inn and Suites at 5630 Dillard Drive in Cary, North Carolina. Because that is a terrible experience and that's the experience I had and I'm not down with that. I feel like I botched a robbery and it's not to just be honest with you. If it was me and I came back from working out and I couldn't find my wallet, I would have assumed I misplaced it. I would have never thought that anybody actually came into my room. So that's why I'm telling you this because this is the type of stuff that rarely ever happens. I've never had this type of situation before the ISG hotel chain, but at this hotel, that's what went down. So please avoid that. Now, like I said, back to this video, it's been kind of a little bit long rant, so please bear with me. Um, today, I was supposed to hook up with a guy named Jonathan. We were supposed to go look at his 570S McLaren HTC hardtop convertible. He reached out to me and said uh, he'd be able to do a video with me when I was out in the North Carolina area. So I'm out here. I was supposed to be hooking up with him today. And ultimately, part of the reason why I was running slow was because I received a text from him this morning saying, hey, man, I apologize. Can we reschedule? Uh, he said he has a, a family emergency. He won't be able to get hooked up with me today to do the video. And unfortunately, 
when he wants to says he should be back available. I didn't go into specifics. He didn't go into specifics why this couldn't happen, but I'll be gone. So like I told him, maybe we can hook up later on in the year to shoot this video. So for the moment, this video was supposed to be about a 570S McLaren convertible, showing you guys an alternative for the pricing that you may end up paying for a Z06. And while I feel like it's actually a good car or if it truly was a good car to own. So we just wanna get into that. So for the moment, what is this video gonna be about now? Hmm. So let's talk about what should be your first supercar. Well, what's the first supercar you should purchase? Okay, if we get into this topic, I think it's actually an interesting topic, especially now since a lot of people are really trying to jump into the supercar community. I'm not even gonna say a lot of people. A lot of people are, one of the biggest concerns or issues I had was I wanted a supercar. So I thought a long hard about it and technically some people say I didn't get a supercar. It is what it is. But I feel like looking at my options, the first problem you have or the first dilemma most people have when it comes to getting a supercar is the maintenance. A lot of people run away from the maintenance of a supercar. A lot of times the term supercar is thrown around with exotic. So you have people that sit there and say that a Maserati Gran Turismo can possibly consider a supercar, which to me is an exotic, so it's not. Um, so I wouldn't consider the Maserati Gran Turismo a supercar. But some people will sit there and say, oh, I got a supercar because they have a Gran Turismo, which to me has less performance than a Corvette. So how all of a sudden, I'm talking about a C7 Corvette, so how can you say a Gran Turismo is a supercar but the C7 Corvette isn't? Now, if you'd have asked me over six months ago, what should be your first entry level supercar? I would have told anybody Acura NSX. The Acura NSX, from the moment it came out in 2017, was probably the supercar I was looking to target. I did not expect it to have such a quick turnaround because in 2017, they were literally giving like 40,000 miles off that car. But I just didn't want to pay six figures at that point in time for a car. So the Acura NSX to me, because of its cheapness and its value, was the perfect entry-level supercar and I often tell people that all the time but within the last few months of 2020 whereas I was looking at an Acura NSX almost a year ago and at that point in time I could have got an Acura NSX for $119,000 so from last from just over 13 months 14 months later and I'll even be more honest with you I was looking at an Acura NSX just for the purpose of when they said the Type S was going to be the last car they make, I was really debating on buying an Acura NSX because I feel like it's going to now become a secret collector's item. And from December, and it's now May, they went up from 129000 to so you're looking at uh, probably 160, 170 grand for an Acura NSX under 10,000 miles. That's crazy to me. So, whereas I would have told anybody starting out because of the performance numbers that your first supercar should probably be an Acura NSX. It will have the styling, it's a mid-engine form, and just based off what it does, it was a bargain, not anymore. So, I wouldn't say an Acura NSX would be your first choice for a supercar anymore. If you want to have a good option for a supercar, I would tell you now you're probably looking at the first generation 
Audi R8. And why do I say that? Because the Audi R8 was always considered an entry-level supercar and the perfect daily driver for a supercar. And to me, although it has the same Lamborghini engine when you go to the V10 model, the V8 is a, is a very good cheap bargain. You still will get the respect because of what it is when it comes to being in the supercar market. But you lose a lot of the, and I can't say it truthfully, it's like the, a better, as I would say, reliable supercar when it comes to maintenance and cheaper for that purpose. But you lose a lot of the whole Lamborghini early generation slash Gallardo transmission issues. And that's a common carrier with the, uh, with that transmission, that's a common carryover with the Gallardo, is that that's a very expensive fix. You're looking at about 10 grand to take the engine out and probably fix the the transmission on an Audi R8 or a early, pretty much, I ain't gonna say early, all the Gallardo years. And it's from my information or from what I got when I was doing research on the car because I really, I'm not gonna lie to you, I really won the 2013, 2014 Gallardo and when I was talking to the Lamborghini dealership and I was interested in getting a Gallardo over a Huracan, the guy straight up told me, because at that point in time, and this wasn't recent, this was probably like 2018, 2019 timeline, um, that the 2015 Huracans were about 140 some thousand, 148 thousand. But I could find a Gallardo for about 120 grand around the 2014, 2013 year model range. And the guy was straight telling me was that you're better off paying the extra 20 grand and getting a Huracan. Because what you're trying to say today, you're gonna end up spending probably a year down the line with a Gallardo because of the transmission. And it's about $10,000 to replace that. So if you're considering a Lamborghini Gallardo as your first entry level supercar, which I hear a lot of people that were looking at Z06s and the way the money is going, they would say, I just go out and get a Gallardo. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't recommend it. So I would tell you go Audi R8. But now at the same point in time, I know a lot of people don't want the R8 with the V8 version, but I feel like the V8 version is more, it's easy to work on. If you're not, if you're quite mechanically inclined, the first generation R8 is easy to work on if you're mechanically inclined. So I would tell you to stick with the V8. The V10 has a lot of the same carryover drama that the Lamborghini Gallardo has. So I would avoid that. So if you're looking for your first entry level supercar, I would tell you a first generation R8 or a Chevy C8. It's funny how that works out, isn't it? Now, when you get away from those two cars, the next thing I would tell you would probably be a Porsche. But some people are going to say the Porsche is in the supercar. It's perception. Uh, I, I can't honestly give you an honest answer on it because I feel like it's probably not. But somehow Porsche gets the same respect in a supercar market. When you go to events and you see supercars, you see a lot of Porsches. You see turbos, uh, Porsche Turbo S's, you, you see GT2 RS's, you see uh, GT3 RS's, so you see Porsche Carrera S's, you'll see Porsche Turbo S's, you'll see a Porsche S4, but they get the respect in the supercar community, so a Porsche will probably be another solid bet. Something that's really coming in low on the radar is also the Mercedes Benz AMG GTC or GTR. Let's take a moment. Please hit the like and subscribe. Like the video if you haven't done it already. If you need to watch some more before you give it a thumbs up, I completely understand. But please share the video if you enjoyed it. Also, subscribe to the channel. We talk about all type of information when it comes to dealing with cars. And I think it's a fun channel to enjoy and see some content from. So please subscribe to the channel. By the way, if you haven't heard, again, the ICMV Drivers Edition $250 gas car giveaway, gas prices are going up and you shouldn't have to make life-changing decisions while you're sitting at the pump. So we're trying to help out with that. 
buy a raffle ticket, enter to win $250 in free gas gift cards. You can also participate in this by going to the website and buy some merchandise between May 2nd and July 15th. And for every $5 you spend, it will be matched off with the same equivalence you would get if you bought raffle tickets. So check it out. There's a link in the description below. We're giving away $250 in gas cards. So you can purchase a raffle ticket on your own or you can get some merch, but either way, you will be answered to win. Let's get back to the video. Something that's really coming in low on the radar is also the Mercedes Benz AMG GTC or GTR. Again, I tell people all the time, this is not a supercar, but yet for some reason. Like I said before, I guess that exotic tag takes over, but I don't even consider it's a true exotic, but it carries over into the supercar market. So you see a lot of these cars in supercar outlets or supercar gatherings, and nobody ever complains about it's not a supercar because it has amazing performance. So I would tell you if you're looking to save some money, the best way to go and get the same respect for being in the supercar market would be a Corvette C8. It's probably gonna be the most reliable thing you can possibly get or the most affordable fix you can get in the supercar market. I will follow that up with by saying a first generation Audi R8. Then I would tell you look at or consider a Porsche 911 Turbo S or AMG GTR but they still right now are kind of costly or getting pricey so I wouldn't recommend them because before you take that leap you really start to cross into the second generation R8 which I think is probably a true supercar because it's a V10 all the way through whether you get the V10, the V10 Plus or V10 Performance you're looking at somewhere between 150 to 180 grand and once you start crossing that table to me it opens up the door for a mclaren and when i say a mclaren you're talking about the 570s the 650s or even the mclaren gt you can find some of them in the low 180s high 190s so there are you there you have it those are the supercars i will put out your way if you're looking to get a supercar so if you're looking to get an entry-level supercar or you're wondering what your first supercar should be I think I just gave you a bunch of options that you can't go wrong with. Now I know some of you are going to be concerned because I did not list a Lamborghini. I did not list a Ferrari. But to me, for your first supercar and you're looking to save money or just get into the supercar game and be respected, those aren't cars that you should really be playing around with. So thank you for tuning in. I see every drives edition. Don't forget to hit the like or subscribe. Share the video. It's some interesting information in here. I'll see you in the next video. I'll see you in these streets. Until then, peace.